Looking for a good book? Don't know which page to turn to? Richard and Judy can help. Check out the book club exclusive to WH Smith. Time for us to catch up with David Raker, missing persons investigator. Already a big hit across the globe, this is the fourth in the series by Tim Weaver, a print journalist by day. It's not for me to judge whether I, I've got there, but um, I hope I have, and I hope that with every book it shows a little more improvement and, uh, and it gets a bit bigger and better, you know. Stay tuned to meet Tim and David here on the Rich Judy Download. We're racing through the autumn collection and you can listen to more of our downloads on iTunes, but we still have plenty to come. I'm Tim Weaver and I'm author of Never Coming Back. I started out live as a journalist. Uh, I left school at 18 and, and sort of stumbled almost into magazine journalism. And from there, uh, I, I kind of, I guess journalism teaches you a lot of uh, good skills, which is like discipline with your writing and hitting deadlines and that kind of thing. So I'd always written from a very young age. I continued writing into my adult years, but the whole time I had a sort of burning ambition to write books. Uh, I, I loved journalism, loved doing it, but I'd always, always wanted to write books most of all. So while I was sort of learning my craft as a journalist at the same time, I was also in my head kind of planning out where I might be able to take a book and a potential series, and that was really where uh, the sort of David Raker series came from. Right, well, the, uh, the next uh, book on our uh, autumn book list is uh, Never Coming Back by Tim Weaver. It's a thriller, and it's uh, Tim's fourth book featuring a specific investigator called David Raker. And uh, they've all done incredibly well, and uh, everyone reckons, and we agree with them, that Never Coming Back is the one that's really kind of uh, pushed David Raker forward into uh, the sort of crime thriller stratosphere. It's a silver bullet, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us, first of all, Tim, tell us about David Raker, because he's, uh, he's obvious, obviously completely pivotal to, to all these books and to Never Coming Back. So tell us what he's like. OK, so David Raker is, is a guy in his uh, early 40s. He's had a fairly kind of tragic uh, past, as, as characters in the crime genre tend to have, uh, except that his is a, a little bit more, I guess, ordinary in a way, in that uh, his, his wife uh, fought a long but ultimately unsuccessful battle with uh, breast cancer and died quite young. So... Uh, in the first book, he's kind of getting over that, and, and throughout the course of the book, it kind of resonates through, and by the point of ne uh, never coming back, he's not over it, but he's kind of at a point where he's definitely moved on. Uh, uh, and parallel to that is his kind of life as a missing persons investigator. Yeah, that's his speciality, isn't it? He that's finds missing people, yeah. He finds missing people, And that's yeah. because he has a sort of empathy with them. He sort of understands yeah, what he might have... he does. Almost by instinct. Tell, tell us about that, how that works. He, I mean... It's, that again has sort of sort of resonated through from the first book. In the first book, he was sort of fairly fresh into that world. You know, he was kind of uh, starting out along that because he, mm. he started out life as a journalist, investigative journalist, and, and and kind of made the leap through through one reason or another into finding missing kids, mm. and then it became missing people. And uh, and by the point that he gets to the fourth book, the, the way he feels about the death of his wife and about the way these people go missing, he he sees the kind of the two very fused together, and he finds it very difficult, I think, to extract himself from that world. He, it becomes a very personal mm. a journey for him, a very personal battle for him. Right. And, and, and I think by finding these missing people, he perhaps feels in some small way that he's sort of making up for the loss of his wife and the yes, loss that he absolutely. feels. Yeah. You know? so, um, so, yeah, missing people have become increasingly more and more important to him. And he, as I say, he, he has an instinct of understanding. He can almost read them, almost remote read them. It's yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that was a really important part of his character, I think, is that um, it's like wanting him to, to really e empathise with people and to really understand people. And perhaps, like, his biggest weapon is his brain. You know, it's like it's it's not he's not a kind of all action no, no, hero. No, no, no. Although he will go to you know he, he does get pushed to yeah. to do some fairly serious but and dangerous cerebral, things. He thinks. He yeah, thinks. and I think that was an important part of it because you know when these people come to him, they're very you know like you know missing missing persons is a very kind of emotive uh, sort of area because you know when people come to him and when people go missing, you're you're sort of grieving for someone who you don't you don't ever know what's happened to them. You know they're gone and. Yeah. But you don't know where, and you can't. You can't. And you don't know why. You, you don't, don't know. Yeah. Exactly. And, well, and you don't know if it's a crime or whether it's a voluntary uh, escape. Yeah, exactly. It's almost a, Mer a, a Mary Celeste thing. I nodded, but didn't say anything. Watching her in the half light of the kitchen, she stared back, composed, still. Then gradually, there was a movement in her lips. She dabbed a finger to her eye. I'm sorry. Don't be. She smiled and then brought a coffee towards her. I'm sure you moved down there to start again. To get away from people like me, I just steam past her face as she looked down into her mug. 
I just don't know where else to go. She's my sister. You said the whole family disappeared? Yes. When? 7th of January. So that's Carrie and who else? Carrie, her husband Paul, Belle and Liv, their two, da two daughters. Five months after dying, I should have ended the conversation there. Deep down, I knew I wasn't ready for this. Not physically, maybe not mentally either. But I didn't. I let her carry on. They live an hour from here, just west of Buckfastley, she continued, tone flat and barely audible, as if the story had been told countless times. I didn't read anything into it. They all became like this sooner or later, wading across old ground, looking for the same answers in the same places. I'd driven up there from Totnes because Carrie and I were supposed to be going out in Torquay with some friends, but when I got to the house, no one answered. Their cars were still on the drive. The lights were on in the house, so I rang the doorbell five, six, seven times. A pause. Nothing. She stopped altogether then and seemed to waver, her upper body swaying like a boat listing on ocean swells. The front door was unlocked, so I let myself in and went along the hallway. They always had a nice house. I know this sounds weird, but it always smelt nice. Flowers and coffee and candles. But it didn't smell nice when I went inside that night. I walked through to the kitchen and the dinner was still cooking. It had just been left like that. Yes, she said, nodding. I remember it vividly. The potatoes were still cooking even though there was no water left in the pan. The pork steaks were burnt to a crisp. Vegetables were half prepared, just left there on the chopping board. It was like the four of them had downed tools and walked out of the house. There was nothing out of place. She turned a coffee mug, lost in thought for a moment. In fact, the opposite, really. Everything was in place. Even the table was set. Cutlery laid out. Drinks prepared. Let's, let, let's get to the plot. Um, Emily Kane, the character, arrives at, uh, at her sister's house, Carrie. And when she get, and it is very Mary Celeste actually. Because when, yeah. when she gets there, the front door's open, it's unlocked, uh, nobody there. Television's on, uh, dinner's on in the kitchen. But Carrie, the sister, and her husband and their two daughters have completely vanished, just yeah. disappeared. And yet the house is as if they're there. And that's where we that's where we begin. It's not one person or two people. It's a whole family. Yeah, yeah. So a whole a whole family has disappeared into into thin air. And uh, and you know, Rake has a very sort of personal connection to this case in a way because Emily, the sister of the wife of the family who's gone missing. Mm was an ex-girlfriend of his way before he met his wife right. when he used to live. Because it's Never Coming Back Returns... The first three books were set in London, but the Never Coming Back Returns Raker to where he grew up. In uh, Devon. In yeah, Devon. in Devon, you know. So he's, he's gone back to the place he grew up, and there he meets, meets uh, Emily again, who he, he dated before he moved to London to, to train as a journalist and go to university. So it's, he's got a very personal connection to the case and the, mm. the sort of strangeness of the case and this kind of, like you say, the Marie Celeste kind of angle really... Mm intrigues him. He's reluctant to take it on originally because he's recovering from some of the events that happened in the previous book, but of course there well, wouldn't be a book if he didn't take it on. <laughs> well, absolutely. But he's called him because the police get nowhere. The yeah, police the, just come up against a complete dead end. Yeah, the police hit a, hit a brick wall on the, on the case. They can't find uh, any... They have some leads, but the leads go nowhere. Uh, so, yeah, Emily's desperate. She wants to find them. She wants to find out what happened to them. And, uh, and so she gets raped on the case, yeah. I was fascinated by um, how honest you are about the process of writing, how difficult it is, to be honest, as we've discovered ourselves, because we've both just written our first time, not, first novel, and now we're sort of struggling with our second. Um, and, Independently, and, not together. No, 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 our second time set novels. <laughs> and I was absolutely charmed by your blog, because you are so open about the constant self-doubt mm -hmm. and... Shall, uh, I, shall I get the quote? He says... Um, what next, he asks on his blog. Where do I go from here? As things don't come together the way that you expect or characters aren't fitting in as well as they did in your plan, the doubts start to creep in. With never coming back, as with all the others, doubt is my passenger. <laughs> it's almost therapeutic, isn't it, to be that confessional about it? Yeah. Is it? Do you really find it that challenging? Yeah, I do find, I do, I do find writing very hard you know I don't find I, I'd actually be deeply suspicious of any writer that came and said you know writing a full-length novel is a walk Piece in the park yeah. yeah I think it's really hard and especially if you set yourself higher and higher goals for each book you know with each book I've, I've attempted to not get into that formulaic kind of every book feels basically the same but just with a new villain mm. I've tried to push myself you know each book and that was part of the reason actually for taking never coming back away from london down yes. to devon is to kind of give it a different flavor mm. and give them a new 
uh, set of experiences and give the world, make the world a little bit different around him. You know? But what is, it, what is it that you find in particularly uh, challenging? Is it the plot line? Because the, these, these books are so... The, the plot line is just so important. It's got to hang together and we've got to be able to suspend our disbelief at all points. Or is it the dialogue? Is it the characterisation? Which, which, which are the bits that you find most difficult? Uh, I would say not necessarily the plot. I, I find that actually uh, ideas uh, are very easy to come by in that you get lots of ideas and mm. you write them all down and think, oh, that would be a good idea. And then you try and sort of shoehorn them Screw into the together, book yeah. uh, and get them all to mesh together. I think what, what's, what's hard with a thriller is that once you... Because it's so intricately built... I'm mm -hmm. not saying all genres aren't like this, but particularly mm. with a thriller, it's so intricately built. Once you pull one little bit out, the whole thing kind of comes mm. down. Mm. And I think it's, it's really important... Uh, in a thriller to get all those little bits kind of fit, it, meshing together all the subplots you have to throw in so many red herrings and twists and you know yeah. could it be him could it be her you know and and all that is just a massive headache and yeah. it, and you know it's kind of like how to how to mesh that together and, and with them it never coming back the, the the difficulty with it was because it's such a uh, it's on quite a big scale, you know, because it's not just That's set right. in Devon. Oh, no, it goes Vegas. to America. Yeah, yeah it goes yeah, to uh, America Vegas. as well because yeah. it's such a big scale it was really hard to kind of mesh those two elements together. Even though I had, from the start, a fairly clear idea of where it was going to go, actually, the reality on the ground when you're there yeah, is yeah, this. Yeah. You don't... In your plan, you say, oh, he can go there and do that and do that. But actually, once you're there, it's like, oh, actually, she's already there and he's, you so know... that bit doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. exactly you, what you mean. What, what, was it in your blog, was it you that mentioned the first 20,000 words mm. are fine and then you hit a wall? And Ian Rankin says that too, and I don't think that he says 20,000... It's another number, but obviously all writers in their heads the find that you yeah. know they, they they hit a wall. Do you think that basically having the same um, the same hero, the same character in every book makes things easier or harder for you? Um, uh, probably a little bit of both. I think that you know with Raker, I know him so well now that mm. uh, it doesn't take me long to kind of get up to speed with him. But at the same time, you have to be very, very careful. I think in a series of, like I say, making it too formulaic, having Raker face the same things over and over and over mm. again. Right. So with every book, you're trying to push into new in new directions and, and face a kind of even greater threat, perhaps. And I think so. It's a it's a balance. It's a really difficult balance a lot of the time. Yeah. I think it is something you have to be very careful of. I mean, I think if I was sort of prepared to sit back and make it a bit more formulaic, it'd probably be a bit easier. Yeah. But for me, that wouldn't be f fun as a writer. It wouldn't be fulfilling as a writer. And I, and I think that sort of self-doubt, tw 20,000 words is my wall, but I'm sure other writers have it. But it, without that self-doubt, I don't think you'd have that kind of ability to step away from it and say, all right, mm. I'm doubtful about this but maybe I'm doubtful for a reason in that I'm attempting something bigger and better with it, yeah. you know. Yeah. And yeah. something else which happens to Raker in this, without giving anything away here, uh, Raker himself becomes a target. Um, the, mm. the investigation becomes so deep and so profoundly dangerous that uh, he actually is in the crosshairs himself. Um, it's a... Listen, all, cast all doubts aside about this one, Tim, because it's great. It's, uh, oh, as, 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 every, as everybody's saying, all the critics are saying the same thing, whether it's uh, The Guardian or The Mail or The Sun, they're all saying, you know, this has taken him onto another level. So whatever doubts you had, you, you really should... Um, Put them to rest. Uh, Tim Weaver, never coming back. Cracking read. Cracking read. Thank you, Tim. Thanks very much. Why do I write? Well, I write because uh, I've always loved writing since I uh, was a little boy. I was the weird kid uh, in, in our town who asked for a typewriter for his 14th birthday rather than the latest Transformer or action figure. Um, I just, you know, from a very young age, loved writing, always wanted to be uh, writing uh, was creating stories from a very young age and, and as I grew older all that changed really was I became very focused on the type of writing the type of genre I wanted to specialize in and that was thrillers. Writing is although I love writing and I feel like sometimes I think it's a bit of a calling most of the time it's just like you look at it like um, a job almost you know you sit down and you know you have to sort of uh, write so many words and I'm not one of these I'm not a method writer you know sits down there and kind of gets has to spend a couple of days in the dark to get into character uh, I just I just kind of uh, sit there and you know what needs to come out comes out I mean some days it comes out you know in the form of lots of words and some days I struggle to to write any words at all but eventually I get there and so no I don't feel like I have to I get into character I just kind of sit down I have my plans in place I know where the story's going and I kind of go from there
grew up reading American crime fiction. I didn't actually read a lot of uh, British crime fiction. Uh, my big heroes are people like uh, Michael Connolly. Uh, he was like, uh, he's kind of like an author I feel like I've grown up reading because his first book came out when I was like 16, 17. And, and over the years, I've continually followed him. And I think he's a, a, an absolute master at his craft and his world, the world he creates is incredible. And, uh, and so, yeah, Michael Connolly definitely uh, has factored big. And Michael Connolly actually opened the door to a lot of classic crime fiction to me because I was quite a late convert to, to the classics like Chandler's and the Hammett's and all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, definitely Michael Connolly. When I see my book on the shelves at WH Smith, I feel uh, hugely excited, really honoured, uh, obviously really proud, a little nervous as well because you don't know, uh, you know, you, ultimately you don't really have a lot of kind of, you can't do a lot about it once it's out there on the shelves. It's for other people to judge, it's for other people to pick up and hopefully enjoy. So, but yeah, definitely proud, really excited to see it. I mean, I, I don't think the buzz has died down about, you know, seeing the book on the shelves and uh, and I, I don't think it will for me. You know, I'd always dreamed of becoming a writer and now four books down the line, I'm, I'm doing it for a living and, and loving every minute of it. What about David Raker, the investigator in Never Coming Back, um, is that he's not a normal cop by any means. He's a man who is far more interested in using his brain, his empathy, his charisma, uh, his instinct than the average macho cop. He's not macho at all, in no, fact. No, no, he's not remotely cold-blooded. He gets deeply involved, emotionally involved in these cases, and that's because his, his speciality, I mean, the field that he's kind of naturally drawn to by instinct, is finding missing people. And that's all to do with his backstory. Um, he has this, like so many private investigators in fiction have, he has this, this rather tragic past which he's working to come to terms with through his work as a private investigator. Um, and he has this extraordinary instinct, this nose, for how missing people might be thinking, what made them disappear in the first place, where they may be. And he does that through extraordinary instinct and not, not guesswork, but a sense of otherness. He's an extraordinary character, and, and I think that as the novels have gone on, and this is the fourth, he's developing into a really, really interesting literary personality, and I can't wait to see this come to telly. I think it'll be a, I think it'll be a great television personality. Yeah, as a woman reader also, I think you really appreciate the fact that he's using his life's background, his life's experiences to solve his crimes. Yeah. He's not just going from, you know, plot to plot or twist to turn. Mm. He is really trying to use what's happened to him in the past, as you said, some of it quite tragic, um, to, to, to solve what's happened to these missing people. And Tim Weaver's opening, is, is, it's a classic, really. I mean, just imagine that, to go to your sister's house, expecting to have dinner with them, um, with sister, husband, two little girls, and there's nobody home, and yet everything there is if they are at home. The television's on. The lights the are on, cooking. the dinner's in the oven, there are drinks ready to be poured, the but they're not there. there. The dog's still there. Running around the And house. yet they have vanished without a trace. It's almost supernatural. Mm. Of course it's not, but it's almost supernatural. And what a great way to start a novel. Mm. OK, A Journey on the High Seas is part of the next tale on the Richard and Judy Book Club. So I'm going to have to dig out my seasick pills, Jude. Ah, yes, the last runaway. Honor had hoped. The sun's glare would blind the man so that he would not see her, but as she peered at the dark form, she sensed a gaze back. He remained very still, so still, that the chicken pecked close by. We look forward to your company once again, exclusive to WH Smith. Get great tips on how to write your own bestseller with exclusive content on our Facebook page. Facebook.com slash Richard and Judy Book Club.